Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of the shooting in Uvalde, Texas? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Salvador Ramos was born in Uvalde, Texas on May 16, 2004. In 2022, he worked part-time at a Wendy's restaurant and dropped out of high school. Sometime around March, he moved out of his mother's house and into his grandmother's house. He had a disagreement about his mother turning off the Wi-Fi. On May 17, he purchased a rifle. The next day, he purchased 375 rounds of ammunition. On May 20, he bought another rifle. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. According to the police, on May 24, 2022, Salvador engaged in an argument with his 66-year-old grandmother about his failure to graduate high school. At about 11 a.m., he shot her in the face before stealing her gray Ford pickup truck. At 11.28 a.m., he rammed the truck into a barricade outside of the Robb Elementary School. Using one of the rifles, he fired at two people who had come out of a nearby funeral home to investigate the crash. Neither of them was shot. Salvador dropped a bag of ammunition and walked closer to the school, discharging his weapon for a few minutes. At 11.33 a.m., he entered the school through a door that had been propped open by a teacher. The police were called right away. Three officers arrived within four minutes after Salvador entered the school. He fired at them, and they decided to retreat. Two of them received grazing wounds. Salvador entered the classroom. He told the students and teachers in the room, it's time to die. He opened fire on them. Eventually, he would kill 19 students and two teachers. The police established a perimeter around the school. Parents were trying to get into the school to save their children. They urged the police to enter the building and confront the shooter. The police responded by handcuffing some of the parents, pepper spraying them, and threatening them with tasers. Some of the police officers entered the school and retrieved their own children. Salvador was in the classroom for about an hour. The police could have easily breached the door at any time and entered the room, but the incident commander decided that this was no longer an active shooter situation. He believed that the perpetrator was better classified as a barricaded subject. For this reason, the police took their time to get into the classroom. They waited for a key from an employee at the school so they could unlock the door. As they were waiting for the key, Numerous 911 calls were placed from inside the classroom. The students were asking for help. At 12.50 p.m., a tactical team forced their way into the classroom and shot Salvador, killing him. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one is the background of Salvador Ramos. He was described as a disturbed young man. He was a loner who had few, if any, friends although on occasion he would have short-lived friendships. It was reported that he tortured small animals, including cats, and would live stream his behavior. A girl that he messaged online said that he told her he threw dead cats into people's houses. Others said that Salvador would go out at night and shoot at people with an air gun, as well as throw eggs at vehicles. He was frequently bullied in school because he had a stutter and a lisp. He was also mocked for his clothing selections and being poor. His classmates would call him names, including school shooter. He would occasionally get in physical altercations with classmates. Salvador used to cut his face with a knife. He blamed the cuts on a cat. He wore black eyeliner on occasion, which only led to more bullying. His co-workers at Wendy said that Salvador mostly kept to himself. Every now and then he would send inappropriate text messages to female co-workers and threaten his co-workers. Reportedly, he said, do you know who I am? Salvador told an acquaintance that he wanted to join the Marines so he could kill people. Salvador had no criminal record and no mental health history. Item number two, what was going on with the mental health and personality factors for Salvador Ramos? It appears as though Salvador had expressed an interest in weapons and murder several times. He wanted people to know what he was going to do. About 30 minutes before the murders, Salvador sent a Facebook message saying that he was going to shoot his grandmother. 
He then sent one indicating that he had shot his grandmother, and he sent a third message saying that he was going to shoot an elementary school. There's no way to know for certain what was happening with Salvador based on the limited information available. One possibility would be that he had psychopathic traits, like he was cold, callous, and lacked empathy. Based on his statement, do you know who I am, it's also possible he had a number of narcissistic traits, like arrogance, grandiosity, and envy. It seems as though Salvador was isolated, socially awkward, and rejected by his peers. There was an increasing disparity between what he wanted in life and what he was able to achieve. His narcissism would have pushed him to eliminate that disparity. By perpetrating the murders, he may have felt as though he accomplished something worthy of recognition. Alternatively, it may have been a punishment to all those people who bullied and rejected him. I think the latter is probably a more likely scenario. He knew that committing those murders would cause tremendous pain to everyone in the community. It would make them suffer, and that's exactly what he wanted. Research tells us that there are several characteristics associated with school shooters. They tend to be immature, the target of bullying, socially awkward, poorly supervised by their parents, and tend to hold a grudge. There's a high level of vindictiveness. Salvador does appear to line up with all of these characteristics. Item number three is the behavior of the police. The police have offered many conflicting accounts about what happened on the day of the murders. At the time making this video, they have made 12 changes to their story. At first, they said that a school resource officer engaged the shooter outside the building. Later, they said there was no school resource officer on duty. They changed the time when the shooter entered the building, moving it from 11.40 to 11.33 a.m. The police said the officers engaged the shooter in a moment's notice. Later, they admitted that there was no engagement for about an hour. This gave the perpetrator a lot of time to commit the murders. The police have refused to answer a number of questions about their horrendous behavior. Among the many stories that they told, the police said that the officers didn't rush in to find the shooter because they were afraid of being killed. He was in the room killing innocent victims while 19 heavily armed police officers were on the other side of the door. It appears as though the police were much more interested in harassing the parents of the students outside the school than they were in actually engaging the perpetrator. This brings me to item number four. Why did the police fail to confront the perpetrator when it could have made a difference? There are probably many reasons. I'll go over a few here. The police are trained that the world is an extremely dangerous place. Everybody is out to get them. They live every day believing that they are just a hair's breadth away from death. This creates paranoia and encourages the officers to behave defensively. They are trained to prioritize their own safety above anything else. This is one of the reasons that we have seen so many incidents where the police shoot unarmed civilians. That same fear creates the opposite reaction when they are faced with an armed suspect. Rather than motivate them to engage, their fear motivates them to stay in one place, to avoid getting involved. Amazingly, the police are within their rights to do this. They have no responsibility to act if someone is being actively harmed. They are not obligated to protect citizens. Another key element here is courage, or in this case, a lack thereof. Police officers are not soldiers in the military. They are not selected for fearlessness and bravery. Rather, they are selected simply because they are willing to take an unpleasant job that few people want. Police officers are typically high sensation seeking, but that doesn't necessarily equate with being fearless. There's a lot that police officers can do to appear brave. They can dress in a uniform, carry a gun, terrorize unarmed civilians, drive unnecessarily fast, but none of these is a true sign of bravery. Many people have accused the officers in Texas of being cowards. A coward is someone who is shamefully unable to control fear and hides from danger. I don't think that these officers were necessarily cowards. It may have been that they were simply not prepared to deal with the stress of an armed confrontation. In the moment of action, they held on tightly to their most basic value, self-preservation. Their decision-making process was biased toward defensiveness. The way that some soldiers survive intense combat is to accept that they are going to die. Therefore, if they live, it's like a bonus to them. It would not be possible or healthy for police officers to have that type of mentality. It might even make them too reckless. 
like they're not afraid of anything. We ask a lot of police officers. We want them to be ready and willing to kill if necessary, but we also want them to be compassionate and empathic. Most police officers go through their entire career without ever having to kill a perpetrator. Life and death confrontations are relatively rare. Many officers are never tested under that severe level of stress. Therefore, they don't know what they will do or will not do in the moment of action. The police officers who failed to confront the perpetrator in this case now know that they are not well suited for police work. They found out at the worst possible time. These officers have the rest of their lives to consider their failure, to contemplate what led them to a place of inaction. Was it their fault? Were they just following orders? Was it the fault of the police department? Do we simply expect too much of police officers? Were they cowards? They will have to consider these questions and hope that the answers they come up with will bring them peace. Those are my thoughts on the Uvalde, Texas shooting. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.